I have a trouble hearing you, so you have a lot of Yes, Can you hear me okay? Yes. You can hear us all right? Yes. Okay, because we're gonna have we're gonna have more people here, Mark, that have actually read the book. Um, so there'll be people that will ask questions, but I'm just hoping you can hear the questions as we're sitting out here in this, in this area. I can hear you when other people are talking; it gets muffled. But when you're talking by yourself, I can hear you fine. Okay, so we'll just make sure we we stick to it that way. Let me make a little introduction, Mark. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about how I've come to know Mark, first of all, Mark Charles, and then I'll let him introduce himself because I really love and appreciate how he introduces himself and his family and his relationships to people in the world. I met Mark in 2019 in April at a Revolutionary Love Conference. And here's Mark up in the front starting to tell me things that are written in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And I say, you're kidding, they can't be in there. And sharing a lot of other things like the Doctrine of Discovery. Well, what's a Doctrine of Discovery? So now I carry my Declaration and Constitution with me and underlying things. And I have learned a lot from Mark listening to he has second cups of coffee um, that come on regularly, and he discusses lots of topics and the like. Um, he actually, when we met him in 2019, this book hadn't come out yet, nor had he uh, uh, stated he was running for an independent as president of the United States, and all that came about in a few months after that time. So I have always appreciated Mark and what he's had to say, and I've learned a lot and struggled a lot thinking about things, and I think he thinks that that's good. So I know in other meetings I've been with him, he says, you know what, you're gonna be mad at me, you're gonna be upset, please don't throw anything at me, and please stay. <laughs> so here's Mark Charles. Well, yeah, to everybody. Let me introduce myself traditionally. So Mark Charles, Yenishia, Tsinbake Dene Nishle, Dotoi Higlini Basichin, in our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We are matrilineals of people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say loosely translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my, my father's mother, is Toihiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsinbake Dene'a. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Toluchitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. So I'm uh, honored to be talking with you today. I'm so grateful that you had the book study and were able to go through the book on Selling Truth. Um, and uh, it's, it's great to be able to connect with people who are reading the book and then answer and dialogue with questions you may have about it. So, yeah, we can go ahead and open it up to questions, whatever you would like to ask regarding what you've been reading in the book. Who would like to start? Could you do a panel synopsis of the book? Um, they're asking if you do just a quick synopsis. No. Um, how... Who ha who in the audience has read the book? <clears throat> okay. Um, I mean, the book is about the doctrine of discovery, which is uh, a doctrine coming out of the Catholic Church. It says things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue pagans and Saracens whatsoever reduce them to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. It's the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever land you find that are not ruled by, by um, white Christian rulers, those people are not human and their lands are yours to take. So this is the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa and colonize the continent and enslave African people. 
because they didn't see them as human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was literally lost at sea, land in Turtle Island. This is what we, they called the New World and claimed to have discovered it. Right. The first sentence of the first chapter of the book says you cannot discover lands that are already inhabited. Um, so the book is really about how this doctrine gets embedded into the foundations of the country and then how the country and the church uses that doctrine to justify uh, things, whether it's enslavement of African people or the genocide and ethnic cleansing of native peoples. And the book is really written from a bipartisan critique where it shows how both the left and the right um, cling to this doctrine as a way to justify uh, political power as well as uh, their legitimacy here on Turtle Island. You talk about a dysfunctional theology, Mark. You know, we're, we're Lutherans and we like our theology. And, and, yeah. we're very, and is that dysfunction more around the idea of exceptionalism, which it seems to in the book, our, our feeling of superiority and uh, supremacy? Well, so, I mean, how is that? Can you frame that question as coming from the book? I'm trying to think uh, if you could just, what, what is it about the that presentation in the book that you have a question about? Um, just the idea of a dysfunction. We don't think we're dysfunctional in that case, but you're, you're telling us um, once we understand the truth or uh, hear some truths, uh, we can come to a point of lament, but uh, that truth telling is based on our dysfunctional view of where we stand in the world, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm trying to, I mean, I could easily just give a lecture, but that's not what we're here to do. So what is the question you're trying to get me to answer is what I'm trying to get from you. From the people who've read the book, what is it about that dysfunctional theology that you're you're trying to wrestle with? Um, I guess I'll, I'll I'll bypass that a little bit and go elsewhere, um, which hopefully we'll get back to it. And that's around using Abraham Lincoln as the defining a person within the book. Um, especially when we've had an Andrew Jackson who was probably appreciated by more people. Um, and for both sides, north and south, uh, why, why choose Abraham Lincoln uh, uh, over anybody else in the discussions? Yeah, so for those of you who've read the book, uh, two of the hardest chapters to read in the book are um, chapters 9 and 10, which wrestle with the adage that the victors write the history. And... Um, as you so we we lay out and right no one really disputes that adage that the victors write the history we accept that if you win a war you get to write about the war um the challenge is is the united states of america has really never lost a war that's ma that matters and so as a result the u.s has been able to write its own history for the past 250 years and so if you imagine right let's just looking at nazi germany if nazi germany um had won World War II, how would they, how would their historians have portrayed Adolf Hitler? Well, he'd be their greatest leader ever, right? Brought them from uh, global obscurity to global dominance. If they had won World War II, how would their historians have uh, displayed or talked about the Holocaust? Well, people deny the Holocaust today. Imagine if they won the war, right? What Holocaust? There wasn't a Holocaust. Um, so we, we, help people understand that, yeah, this is what would have happened in a, a place like Nazi Germany had they won the war. So then the, the chapters 9 and 10 goes through the, the, the history of Abraham Lincoln, and it points out how he was a blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacist, and one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. Um, you know, uh, where he he was actively trying to ethnically cleanse uh, the route to the Transcontinental Railway in order to complete Manifest Destiny. And so that led to a lot of atrocities taking place across the country, uh, up in Minnesota, in 
uh, Utah and Colorado and even in the southwest of the Navajo and other tribes in the southwest area. And so he was actively. So basically, we did the same thing to someone we call our greatest hero when actually he was a blatant white supremacist. And he, I mean, he, by his own words, right? If you read the quotes in the book, he was he was a self-proclaimed white supremacist um, who had no intention of, of uh, giving of allowing blacks to vote or to or to become judges or jurors or participate in our society at all. Um, and so, yeah, so the the book really tries not only to wrestle with we don't know the truth about who Abraham Lincoln is. But it also wrestles with the fact that not only is Abraham Lincoln not much different from Hitler, and the book makes that fairly clear, it also asks, what does it say about us? Because we're actually not that different from Nazi Germany. Um, we have a lot of the same values. In fact, one of the reasons we hold Lincoln in such high regard is because of the ways that he was able to uh, kind of... Um, perpetuate the lie of white supremacy and complete manifest destiny through the ethnic cleansing of native peoples. So, I mean, I, I don't have, uh, the point of this is not to give you the history. It's for people who read the book. I, if you have questions about things you read in the book, I'm very happy to try and find a way to answer your questions that you may have specifically about the book. Um, Common memory, Mark, <laughs> and George Erasmus. Um, what does that look like? I'm struggling with if, if truth is being known as we're reading your book and we're reading history. Um, and George Erasmus says that um, there, there is no sense of community unless there's a common memory. Um, what does that look like? What, what comes next? Okay. Um, let me just ask one more time. It's just I want to make sure I know who I'm talking to. If you have read the book, could you raise your hand? How many people have read the book in the room? You see it, Mark? Only a few, right? So most of the people in the room have not read the book? Correct. Right. Okay. Um, I need to think about how to answer this in a way where I don't lose everybody because... Um, let me, um, one of the quotes that we use commonly in the book are that we one of the quotes that we use in the book comes from George Erasmus, who is an indigenous leader up in Canada. And he was writing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that they had there in regards to their nation's history with residential schools. Now, Canada's history is not that different from the United States' history with residential schools. Um, residential schools are schools run by the church and the government to forcibly assimilate Native peoples to Western European culture. They took children from their homes. They um, brought them to these military-style boarding schools. They were punished for speaking their languages. They were punished for practicing their culture. The stories of abuse emanating from these schools um, that the kids received emotionally, physically, mentally, and sexually is literally gut-wrenching. And the last of these schools didn't close until the 1970s and 80s. So these were running until just a few decades ago. Um, Canada had a, a National Truth and Reconciliation Commission to help the 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 nation now actually was it was actually initiated by the boarding school survivors the residential school survivors in Canada and they they had filed a lawsuit against the government and against the churches regarding the history of these residential schools and the lawsuit never went to court it was settled 
and the money that was some of the money was that was paid for the settlement was given to uh was set aside by the survivors to fund a national truth and reconciliation commission they spent over 60 million dollars to fund that so there was this commission that went around the country and they held these conferences all around the country they were basically open forum conferences where survivors or the ancestors of survivors could come forward and tell their story. There were representatives of the church. There were also representatives of the, uh, of the government who were there sitting in the front. Um, and they were not allowed to talk. They had to only listen to the stories. They couldn't try to give context or justify or explain. They had to just sit there and listen. And at the end of the conference, those participants were given an opportunity to speak. But again, the only thing they were allowed to say after having heard the stories from the survivors of what happened in these schools was what they and their institutions or their agencies would do to ensure something like that never happened again. They were able to make public commitments of reconciliation. What were they gonna do to make sure this never happened again? As George Erasmus, this native leader was writing about this and trying to gather support the a, a quote that he used was he said where common memory is lacking where people do not share in the same past there can be no real community if you want to build community he said you have to start by creating common memory um and so what this uh what this uh the way i use this quote is right our nation especially both in Canada and in the U.S., there's no common memory. You have a white majority that remembers a mythological history, an untrue history of discovery and expansion, opportunity and exceptionalism. It's not a true history. And you have Native peoples and Black people and other peoples of color who have the very lived experience of stolen lands and broken treaties, of enslavement and Jim Crow laws, of of, of internment camps and um, uh, all of these atrocities, families being ripped apart at our borders, and there's no common memory, right? Our nation does not share a common memory. And I point out that that is one of the reasons why there we have such unhealthy community in our country, right? There's no point in the US history where we can look back and say, oh, Let's think about how great things were in the 60s or in the 50s or in the 40s or in the 30s or in the 20s or in the, right? None of those points are better. The only people that can look back on history with any sense of nostalgia are white landowning men. For everyone else, women, people of color, every other modern, the history was worse, right? It wasn't better. It wasn't great. It wasn't nice. It was worse. And so we don't have a common memory. And I point out that's one of the reasons why I think we have such unhealthy community. And so what that what that requires is for us to go out of our way to intentionally learn this history, to learn the history like from the doctrine of discovery, to learn. And, and, and this is one of the reasons I wrote this book um, on Selling Truths is it, it really challenges people to, to think through what happened and how these things were set up um, and the history that took place so that we can all have a much more accurate collective memory about who we are as a nation, what took place in order for this country to be established, and what are the issues that we need to work through in order to, to make this um, a, better, a better and more healthy place to live. Yes, I see a hand in the back. Okay, I did not read the book. I did not get a copy of it. Um, I'm going to ask the question because you brought it up, and I think it's you probably have the answer to it. If not, just tell me you don't want. I'll be okay. Uh, St. Joseph's Indian School in Chamberlain, South Dakota, still operating. Are you familiar with them? Um. I'm not familiar with that school. I know most of the boarding schools. I don't know if this is a boarding school or who it's run by. I do not know of, of I have not heard of any that are still operating under the same methods that they were working with before. Um, but 
there were several running back until the 70s and 80s, but I have not heard of any that are, I, they're still Indian schools, right? There's Santa Fe has an Indian school, Albuquerque has an Indian school, and there, the Sippy, there's a, a college in, there's tribal colleges uh, that are run and enrollment is, is primarily uh, Native Americans or, or indigenous peoples, but they're not functioning from the best of my knowledge as uh, a way to forcibly assimilate um, Native peoples to Western European culture. Um, the reason I want to say Joseph's is because I'm starting to see the ads for them on the TV, and it's on the Crow Creek Reservation. It's a Dakota. It's it's not Lakota. It's of the Dakota tribe. Okay. Yeah. Is, so I I don't know about that school specifically, but. Um, I, I'm not aware of any schools that are running today that have forcibly uh, taken students from their homes and enrolled them in either church or government schools against their will and holding them there against their will. I'm not aware of that. Um, but I, I don't know about that school specifically, but I, I'm not aware of any that are running under the boarding school model, um, whereas they were operating that way up until the 70s and 80s. Yeah, it's not it's not cultural genocide it, because there, it's pro-cultural, not cultural genocide there. But it's I don't know if you've seen the lady, the the, the Sue, I know Sue is a bad name, and I should say that. The Lakota woman, you know, this big statue is right there at St. Joseph's. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Mark, trauma, how, how do you find understanding your book talks about perpetrator-induced trauma? How does that help you talk to people like, like us? Um, so there's a lot of challenges with the, uh, the history that, I that gets presented in the book. For those of you um, who have not read it, I would highly recommend that you read the book because it lays out a history of this country that you've never heard before. Um, most people are shocked at how intentional the genocide was, how widespread it was, and how devastating it was to Native peoples. Um, this isn't something that just a few bad actors were doing um, on the side. This is something both the churches and the government was actively engaging in as they were seeking to complete manifest destiny. Um, and uh, so whether it's quotes from Abraham Lincoln or whether it's actions by the U.S. government or whether it's, you know, things like uh, pastors from Methodist churches leading the charge in massacres, such as the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado. Um, you know, the, the the history is really, really traumatic. And when, when you talk about that history, uh, and especially I, one of the ways I phrase it in the book is that when you talk about the history, um, you don't people don't understand trauma correctly. So when I say trauma, most people immediately think of what's called a PTSD or a post-traumatic stress or a post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which is a, it's an individual diagnosis for something that, um, uh, a horrifying event that happened uh, a single time to someone. So if you're in an accident, you can get PTSD. If you're a soldier and you're in a battle, you can get PTSD. If you are in a relationship and you get abused, you can get PTSD. Um, it's an individual diagnosis for someone who's experienced a single horrifying event. There's also what's known as a complex PTSD. A complex PTSD doesn't come from a single event, it comes from a series of events. So um, if you can get PTSD from being in a battle, you can get complex PTSD from living in a war zone. If you can get uh, PTSD from, from being um, assaulted, you can get complex PTSD from living in an abusive relationship. And uh, 
psychologists, when they observe this, they, they don't know how it gets passed down, but they observe the symptoms of a complex PTSD in the children and the grandchildren, the people who experienced it. They're not sure how it gets there, but they do observe it there. And then there's a third trauma known as HTR or historical trauma. HTR is not an individual diagnosis. It's how psychologists understand the dissatisfaction in a much broader community. Um, and it was first diagnosed uh, by a, a native psychologist who was working with uh, residential school survivors. Um, and, uh, and she saw what it was doing to the entire community and the way that they were responding and reacting to things. Um, you can also see HTR, our historical trauma, present in uh, people who experienced uh, the internment camps, or Jewish people who experienced the Holocaust, or Black people who experienced segregation, or Jim Crow, or even enslavement. You can see it as it's being in, in the, the subsequent generations. So I refer to historical trauma as a multi-generational communal manifestation of a complex PTSD. And understanding that helps me uh, engage better when I have audiences of marginalized people, people of color, uh, who are sitting in my audience. And I know if I talk about this, it's going to trigger a, a response or it's going to you know, cause a reaction this way. And so I can have resources available. I can be more gentle as I bring things up. I can just be aware how these things are going to affect my audience. But the challenge is, is some of the most uh, difficult conversations and some of the most disruptive demographics in dialogues on race and on this history is not people of color, it's white people. Um, and uh, and was I was out speaking and traveling. Uh, I've been talking about these things for almost two decades now. And initially, I would I would notice that it was I actually kind of guessed estimated it was one half of one percent of my white audiences were going to be so triggered or traumatized by what I said that they would stand up in the middle of a lecture and call me a liar. Didn't happen every time, but one half of one percent of of my audience would react that way. Um, and I was trying to understand what was causing this, right? They didn't have a PTSD. They didn't have a complex PTSD. They weren't suffering from historical trauma. None of them were victims of these events. So why were they reacting the way they were reacting? And uh, as, I was, as I was pondering this, I talked with some colleagues in the psych field trying to understand what I was observing. Um, they agreed I, I was seeing symptoms of trauma, but they didn't know where to place it because these were these were people who were not on the victim side of the event. And then I came across a book by a, a psychologist named Rachel McNair, and she was writing about what she called the psychology of killing. And what she wanted to know is if um, society gives you permission to take a life. You're in law enforcement, you're in the military, you're in certain aspects of the medical community, and you have, even you're a good white guy at the mall with a gun, right? And you're allowed by society to take a life. Um, and, and she wants to know, what does that do to you psychologically? What happens to you psychologically when you take a life? And she found that it caused what she called a perpetration-induced traumatic stress, PITS. Um, Pitts, she uh, she learned had all of the, or she observed that Pitts had all of the symptoms of PTSD, except PTSD afflicted the victim, whereas Pitts afflict the perpetrator, or the person who caused the violence. And so, using her research, I hypothesized that if PTSD has a multi-generational communal manifestation at a complex level, which we call historical trauma, which afflicts our communities of color, then might not Pitts also have a multi-generational communal manifestation at a complex level, which is the trauma I was observing in my white audiences. And I, I, I realized, yeah, because you can't build a nation on 500 years of systemic, institutionalized, graphic, violent, racial injustice without traumatizing yourself. And so I began engaging with my white audiences as another group of traumatized people. Um, and I, I would 
uh, and and the first symptom of trauma is shock and denial, right? That's the when when you're when you're traumatized by something, your body in a self protection mode goes into shock and denial. And so when we look at our history, right? And most people, I, I use this in reference to Lincoln all the time, right? Everybody knows Lincoln. Almost everyone loves Lincoln. And everyone knows enough about Lincoln to know they don't want to read the Lincoln Douglas debates, right? Because they know there's some things in there that Lincoln said that they don't want to know because they don't want to wrestle with that. So we have an intentional ignorance about Lincoln, right? We we love to believe he he freed the slaves. He abolished slavery. Well, if you read the 13th Amendment, it doesn't actually abolish slavery. It says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereas the party has been duly convicted shall exist. 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. We live in a nation where slavery is not only legal, it's constitutionally protected in our criminal justice system, the criminal justice system that has the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world, and the criminal justice system that incarcerates people of color at three to five times the rate it incarcerates white people. And we don't want to know that, right? We would rather be ignorant of that because, again, the first symptom of trauma is shock and denial. And we especially don't want to know that Lincoln's the one who gave us that gift. Right. He's the one who. His legacy was the 13th Amendment. He had no intention of making voters or jurors of Negroes or allowing them to hold office or ordinary marry with white people. He said there's a physical difference between the white and black race, which I believe will forever forbid the two from living in terms of social and political equality. As long as they must remain together, there has to be the position of superior and inferior. And I said Lincoln, as much as any other man believes that the superior position belongs to the white race. He was a blatant, unapologetic, self-proclaimed white supremacist. And it states that very, very clearly in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which is why we don't like to read them. We would rather be in denial about that part of who he was and our history. And we would like to, we would like to have the 13th Amendment that, I mean, we love the fact that that clause is there, but we don't like to mention that because, right, we we have the the ability now, our law enforcement has the ability to remove the civil rights of people of color on a whim, and there's nothing they can do about it, right? That's the constitutionally protective use of law enforcement. Slavery is still legal in prison. And so these are the things that we as Americans, and what I found white America is generally not only naive of, but in denial about. They're in a state of shock and denial. They don't want to know what they don't know. And so, and so this is one of the reasons where I, when I teach this, a lot of my white audience gets very uncomfortable because they don't want to know these things. Right. They don't want to know that as recently as 2005, the Supreme Court ruled that based on the doctrine of discovery, natives do not have rights to our traditional lands. They don't want to know that the reason you can have a land title to your house in this country is not because there was a treaty made with native nations that said they'll give up these rights for these things and you can have them. all those treaties were broken. There's no treaty that gives you the right to the house that you own. And if, the, if a native person were to sue and say our nation had this land and it goes to the Supreme Court, which it did in 2005, the legal justification the Supreme Court will use is the doctrine of discovery, which is because natives are savages, they cannot own the land. Therefore, the right of discovery and the title to the land belongs to white people. That's literally the ruling. And, and these are the things that our nation doesn't want to deal with. It doesn't know what to do with these things. And so this is where I uh, observe in my audiences that they would, they would hear these things, they would learn these things, and they wouldn't know what to do with those things. And so they would, they would stand up. I'm, you know, uh, uh, George... George, sorry. You asked earlier about, about the myth of American exceptionalism, 
right? And you, I, if you want, I can go into that for just a moment right now and kind of explain that very quickly. Yeah. Or would you like, is there another way? I, I'm trying to make sure everyone's on track with this. Is there any, uh, something else you'd like me to cover? Mark, let's assume yes. that, that this white audience is accepting your message and saying, yep, you're absolutely right. We've been living in denial. So help us move forward. How do we rewrite and find a common history that moves in the direction that you suggest? How do you move forward? So, so my co-author of this book, his name is Sung Chan Ra. He's a professor of theology at uh, Fuller Seminary. And the book he wrote prior to this, uh, to the book we wrote together is called Prophetic Lament. It's uh, one of the, uh, it, it really talks about the, the spiritual discipline of lament. He researches our church, the church, the broader Western church, the American church, and finds that based on the songs we sing and the sermons we preach and the theologies we have that the Western Christianity in general and the American church specifically is what he calls anemic at lament, right? And we can see that quite clearly, right? We can't even get through, for example, a Good Friday service without reminding ourselves, well, Sunday's coming, right? <laughs> Don't worry, Sunday, things are gonna be brighter on Sunday, right? We, we, we can't, we struggle even to lament through the Saturday um, without clinging to a hope of, I mean, the disciples didn't know Jesus was gonna rise. They weren't aware that was gonna happen. They were completely shocked when they saw it. And so Saturday must've been absolutely hopeless. It must've been an absolute day of lament. Lament is not repentance. Lament is not um, asking for forgiveness. Lament is sitting in the brokenness and allowing the depth of the brokenness to, to, to realize the depth of the brokenness. I often frame it in the sense of, right, if, if you have a, a house that's on a bad foundation, you're going to get cracks in your walls, you're going to get uh, um, uh, cracks in your, win in your windowsills, you're going to have a creaky floor, you're going to have chip paint. And you can repaint the walls, you can caulk your windows, you can recarpet your floor all you want. But what you got to do to fix the house is go into the basement and inspect the foundation. And that's the scary part, right? It's much cheaper and easier and it looks better temporarily if you just repaint the walls, caulk the windows and carpet the floor. But to go in and look at the foundation and say, okay, what needs to change? That's a much deeper commitment because then you find out how bad things really are and how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take to fix it. And I, that's what I talk about. That's the purpose of lament. Lament is not fixing it. Lament is understanding the depth of the problem so that you're able to have the energy and the vision and the understanding to fix it. And so one of the calls we make very clearly in, in the church, and again, this is the, the, the challenge with the trauma, right? Most of my white audiences, and when they hear the depth of the problem, they immediately want to fix, right? Well, where can I write a check to? Where can I donate some money to? Where can I do something to, to fix this problem? Well, the problem is in the foundations of our country. Our Declaration of Independence refers to natives as savages. The Constitution never mentions women, specifically excludes natives, counts Africans as three-fifths of a person, and protects the whole institution of enslavement in our 13th Amendment, right? This doesn't matter who's in office and who's not in office. This is about fixing our foundations. And so, and so this is where we work very hard in the book to point people to that and say, these are foundational level problems. And so one of my visions is I am calling for a national dialogue on race, gender, and class, right? A conversation I would put on par with the truth and the reconciliation commission that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. But I wouldn't call ours truth and reconciliation. Why? Because reconciliation is inaccurate, right? Reconciliation is about restoring an original harmony, right? You're, you're reconciling, you're, you're bringing something back to a harmonious state. Well, 
that actually never happened here. There's no point in our nation's history where there was a, 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 a healthy state of relationship between European explorers or European uh, settlers or whatever and native peoples, right? This thing began in a brokenness. And so I would say we don't need a truth and reconciliation commission. We need a truth and conciliation commission. We have to actually work out these challenges and these differences literally for the very first time. And so to do this, we need to find a way to uh, understand the depth of the problem. So the problem isn't just where, where, and I'm not saying you're suggesting something this simplistic, but people are like, well, where can I just donate money to or what can I, and I'm like, this is going to require a dialogue that will literally put your title to your house on the table. Now, that's a much more serious dialogue, right? Because you like to think you own your house. You paid for it. Maybe if it's been your house, your family refuge. Well, but that land was originally stolen because the U.S. government operate under a doctrine that said natives aren't human, so therefore no one owns this land. And so we discovered it, so we get the title to it. And so this is where I'm saying we have to fix it at that foundational level. And the only way we're gonna get to that level of conviction where we're willing to be that invested in making the change is if we first go through a process of lament. So in his book, Sung Chan refers to lament as it's like being at a funeral dirge, right? You don't go to a funeral to, to, to celebrate. You don't go to a funeral even to raise someone from the dead. You go there to mourn. You go there to say goodbye. You go there to mourn the loss. And so what we call the church to do in the book on settling truths is and we we literally end the book by pointing out how these values are so deeply rooted in the left and the right the conservative and the liberal side of the church and of american politics whether it's white supremacy either implicit or explicit whether it's uh, appreciating this violence either implicitly or explicitly they're so present in both sides of the church. And the both sides of the church are so deeply both committed to and dependent on the role of Christian nationalism that we actually conclude the church in its current state has no role in the healing of this problem because its solution generally is gonna be, well, we just need the nation to act more Christian. Well, that's what actually caused the problem in the first place. So we need to, we need to actually, so we, we literally, we challenge the church. The, the book was written as a public rebuke of the church saying, if the church wants to be actively engaged in this healing, the church needs to go through a process of lament. And I we we frame it as this is not this is not a day of lament, not a service of lament, not even a month of lament. We call it a season of lament. When you look in the scriptures, whenever the people of God lament, God always shows up. But God never comes as quickly as the people would like. So they're sitting in lament much longer than they're comfortable. And when God shows up, God usually has a different idea of how to lead out of it than the people had. And so it requires much more investment, much more work, and much more commitment. But because they've been there for so long, they're ready to do that. Well, the church, as Sun Chan points out, is anemic at lament. And so we don't stay in lament long enough for God to show up. So there's a whole side of God's character we actually rarely, if ever, interact with because we don't stay in lament long enough for God to show up. 
And so our call to the church is to sit in what we call a season of lament. Can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like? How how is this enacted? You can't just you can't just write land acknowledgments and say this is terrible. What does this look like? What does the season of the land look like? And and that's where it's going to look different for every church, right? So one of the way I one of the ways I encourage churches to begin engaging in this is to is to actually build relationship with the people whose land you're living on. Not just go to one or two events, but to build an ongoing long-term relationship with the people whose land you're living on. Even if that means traveling across the country, maybe they got moved all the way to Oklahoma or to Nebraska or wherever else they moved so many of these native nations to. Um, but you know, but to, but to, to actively begin building relationship with the people whose land you're living on. And as you're building that relationship, learn the history. And in that, in the dynamics of that relationship, begin to, to ask questions and understand, okay, what does it look like now to bring healing into this relationship? What does it look like to lament this relationship? And one of the, for me, one of the, for me, lamenting is not sitting in sackcloth and ashes and just crying all the time. For me, lament is often resisting the urge to take the simple solution, right? It's, it's, it's continuing to allow the depth of the brokenness to be impressed upon me so that when God does open my eyes or show me the path to take, I'm much more willing to walk down that path, right? When Nehemiah lamented, and God had something far greater in mind than Nehemiah ever thought about rebuilding that wall. But because Nehemiah went through this very long process, when God actually began opening the doors for Nehemiah to do something, Nehemiah was able not just to walk through those doors himself, but to get many, many people to follow him to invest in the incredibly hard, dangerous, and expensive work of rebuilding the wall. And so this is where the book really challenges people and challenges churches to, you know, I, I suggest as a great next read, after you read On Selling Truths, to read Prophetic Lament, because that will then give you some great places to begin discussing what does it look like for our congregation, even for our denomination, to go through the process of lament. And how is that going to look for us? What are going to be the easy routes we're going to be tempted to take that will take us out of lament quicker than we probably should? And what, what can we do to, to deepen our understanding of the brokenness that's going on so that we can actually begin to put in the really hard work of fixing it? I'm going to ask another, but what about, and I know I want to get your opinion on it, is giving back sacred lands to the native tribes. I know it really hasn't been done since the blue bay was given back to, I believe it was the Navajo, right? So again, one of the challenges, and right now there's an entire land back movement, and I'm actually doing some research on the land back movement and how that works. But one thing you need to understand is reservations, native nations, we don't own our reservations. They're not our lands. They're lands held in trust for us by the US government. And this is because of the doctrine of discovery. We're not allowed to own these lands. Now, does that mean all these people who are putting the lands back into the trust that's held by the government in, in being held for these nations is bad? No, that's not a bad thing to do. But the problem's deeper than that. We have to deal with the fact that the U.S. government feels it has the right to hold our lands in trust for us, and we're not allowed to be sovereign over our lands. And and this is this is where it, it gets really challenging. And so, yeah, this is where I'm saying, yeah, we need to look at these things at a very foundational level, because 
a lot of what we're being told are the solutions actually aren't the right solutions because they don't address the root of the problem. They address, again, we're, we're repainting the walls, we're recarpeting the floor, we're caulking the windows, but we're not fixing the foundation. And so these are, so yeah, that's a good question about, about land titles. And I don't have all the answers for that, but I know based on the stuff I have researched and, and the things I do understand about these things is the land back movement, while that's not a bad movement and it's a way to begin taking some steps, it doesn't deal with the fact that the U.S. government holds trust, holds lands in trust for Native nations in the first place. And this is where we have to begin. So that's where I'm trying to address it is at that level. The, that's the, the place I'm trying to take the conversation to. Is, is there a, a some ultimate fallacy of ownership of anything? In other words, uh, if in our Christianity we understand that this is God's creation, uh, the creative force of life that, that touches everything, and and that is 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 there for to our share uh, and uh, my understanding is it at least in in some places that uh, the uh, Native American people really uh, related to these new people coming in in a, a supportive way and then when the whole sense of ownership got in there, uh, then uh, uh, all of a sudden it, it was no longer, we're in this together. This is mine. Don't you yeah. know? You're, you're located in Seattle, correct? Is that where your church is in Seattle, correct? Uh, west of there across the water in Big Harbor. Yeah, Pacific Northwest, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so Lewis and Clark is much more relatable as the discoverer of your lands than Columbus is, right? Columbus was way on the East Coast, never made it even much onto the continent, let alone all the way across the continent. But Lewis and Clark has a much longer and more uh, memorable legacy in the Pacific Northwest. I just did two speaking presentations for the National Park Service uh, earlier this year where I talked about Lewis and Clark. And the Lewis and Clark expedition um, that took place in the early 1800s, um, it actually was planned and was, it was scheduled to start before the Louisiana Purchase. So all of the land west of the Mississippi was French land and some of it was Spanish. So the way discovery worked is if you discovered a river, so the French discovered the Mississippi River, that meant they got the watershed of everything to the to the side of that river. So when the French just because the, the there were already American colonies on on the East Coast, the French discovered the Mississippi River. So then they quote unquote got the land all on the western watershed of the Mississippi River. That was their land, which was was what we purchased with the Louisiana Purchase. And so as Lewis and Clark were planning this expedition, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was president at the time, basically said to Lewis and Clark, their message to the native nations living west of the Mississippi was right now they were, their only contact was with uh, mostly uh, French fur traders, right? Who were coming down some from Canada and coming up from the Mississippi and from the Gulf. And so uh, the message that Thomas Jefferson gave to Lewis and Clark was let the natives know that we will be better partners in trade and in military and in security for them than the French will be. And they will they, it would be good it will be beneficial for them to build a good trade relationships and to write good treaties with the US government than with the French. Right. There was going in as peers. Right. And you're on the land and the, the French are trying to dominate you and you'll do better to partner with us than you will with the French. Well, literally just prior to Lewis and Clark leaving on their expedition with their core of discovery, 
uh, Thomas Jefferson was able to negotiate the Louisiana Purchase. So originally they were going into foreign territory and now they were going into U.S. lands that we had just purchased. And the moment he made this purchase, uh, he called in Lewis, he called in Lewis and basically said, I have a new message for you to give to the Native nations, all the Native peoples you're going to meet. And that message is they have a new great white father, Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson, and they will be wise to listen to, to, to do what we tell them to do, right? There no longer was there the sense of we're peers and we're partners and it's now we're over you. We have dominion over you. And as you read the Lewis and Clark expedition, right, there were numerous times Lewis and Clark were, they were weak. They were, they were out of bearings. They were out of resources. They literally had to be saved and protected by tribes that they met. And they did, they helped them, they protected them, they they showed them how to eat and how to navigate through the mountain passes and things like that. And then when you look at the history after the expedition, so many of the native nations, whether it's the Shoshone or the other nations that they met west of the Mississippi, all the way up to the Pacific Northwest, are nations that our country enacted massacres and ethnic cleansing and genocide, genocidal campaigns against them as the country established its presence going further and further west. And so, and so this, uh, that, right, and so that's much more uh, the situation where you're in in the, in the Pacific Northwest is you're much more under the discovery of Lewis and Clark as compared to under the discovery of Columbus. I mean, it's, and it's the same doctrine. It's the same understanding that allows that to take place. And so um, this is where I, I really in, in encourage people to understand how this, this, mentality of discovery didn't just happen once and now it's over but it continues to kind of perpetuate itself throughout history because we've never really gotten rid of it we've never really kind of of, of gotten out of it did i answer your question fully sir or is there a part of your question that i forgot about i'm just saying that the, the ultimate thing has has always been the the evil of ownership because when we talk about ownership, we say, this is mine and it has no benefit for you at all. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that, uh, how do we get at that? That's the struggle. Because, you know, we can talk about land ownership and all that kind of stuff. But it, with my coat, you know, everything that we have, we, we, we get it to, this is mine, don't you touch it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's for my powerful use period that's the evil that's a part of humanity and i think we as a church need to continually struggle with it. and this is where i would encourage you to read chapters three and four of unselling truths um they really go in depth about how the church went from the teachings of jesus who said things like, love your neighbors and pray for those who persecute you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, how we got from those teachings to a doctrine that said you can kill people who don't look like, worship like, eat like, or speak like you. And that journey, I don't have time to go into it right now, but that journey of how that happened is fascinating as far as what the church kind of forgot, intentionally forgot, or wrote out of its own history regarding who Jesus was and what Jesus taught in an effort to kind of embrace the idea of a, of a, of a Christian nation or Christian nationalism. Um, I would highly recommend that you, you read through chapters three and four of Unselling Truths because it, it lays out how the church basically became a Christian empire. Um, and then what does, and then that can lead to a great discussion. What does that mean for us today? How do we repent of that? Which is something I would argue it started not even with Constantine. It started with Eusebius, who was the person who baptized Constantine. 
um, and it's written, it's, you can see it all throughout the teachings and the theologies of uh, St. Augustine and St. Aquinas, um, uh, right? You can see it, how it influenced their teachings as they, as they embrace the teaching and the understanding of Christian nations and Christian nationalism. Um, and then to have a really good discussion on what does it mean for us to begin to, to repent of that? And to wash our hands of that and not embrace those values that have been a part of the church literally now for 1600 years. Um, and so, yeah, the, the book has a fairly sharp critique of Augustine uh, and of the ways that he embraced uh, the heresy of Christian empire. Thank you, Mark, very much for your time. Answering some questions. Yeah. I know that uh, what I'll be sharing with them is the ELCA does have a truth and healing movement going on led by Vance Black Fox, which I think I brought his name up to you once before. So I'll, yeah. encourage, I'll encourage people to go there as well to, to start that process. Okay. And just so you know, I am tentatively planning a trip out to Seattle um sometime in uh either late november or early december i don't yet have the date worked out for that and I, I i apologize um i was not prepared to kind of teach here i was prepared to more answer questions and so i i didn't want to leave people who hadn't read the book kind of off of of some of this teaching but if you would like to to work with me to to bring me to your church um, one of the days I'm in Seattle to actually give you one of my presentations on the doctrine of discovery, and we can go much more in depth than we did today and talk about the history. I would be thrilled to kind of try and work that out with you. I don't have the dates of the week I'm going to be there uh, on my calendar yet, but we are looking at some potential dates, um, either late November or early December. And I'd be thrilled if you'd like me to come in and, and do a teaching at your church and and have a gathering like this where we could I could actually be prepared to give you a lecture on the doctrine of discovery and lay out a lot of the things that we kind of touched on today. I would love an opportunity to do that if you'd like to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, you take care. Have a good day, Mark. All right, we'll be in touch. Book is free on if you've got Audible app. If you go to Amazon, you can get the Audible version for.